we got to recognize that we're in probably the most complicated macro environment ever. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. Thanks for joining us for part two of our interview with market technical analyst Sven Henrik. If you haven't yet watched part one of this discussion with Sven, in which he explains how the current market is locked in a battle of control between the bulls and the bears, it is likely to break and break big one way or the other very soon. Head over to our channel at youtube.com slash Wealthion and watch it there first. It sets the context for the investment themes we discuss in this video. All right, let's get started watching part two of our interview with Sven Henrik. Okay, so I want to end on a, on a big red stake question for you. But before we get there, let's get to the question of, okay, we've got regular people regular investors who are watching this and they are trying to figure out what what you know what to do this year um given your current reading of the tape as it is are there any particular asset classes sectors etc that you're looking at that are saying these seem poised to move in some notable way shape or form either up down flat whatever well we're mostly focused on us indices specific S&P, NASDAQ, and, and, and small caps. Um, you know, obviously, I've been known to kind of dabble a little bit in Bitcoin as well. Um, all those are still related in terms of the liquidity trade. Um, I don't have a particular preference in terms of sectors at this point. I think it's all been trading together again. Okay. I did note that this is where I go back to this negotiation phase. Uh, and shifting market behavior. Um, in late last year, the Dow started outperforming uh, and the NICE started outperforming while the NASDAQ was relatively weak. That equation had now changed here at the beginning of the year. And as NASDAQ and S&P broke out, all of a sudden I see the Dow making lower highs. That has also led me to believe, along with these overbought signals, that we have the possibility of this retest phase of the breakout here. I think next week is key in this regard. Uh, I know it's it's ridiculous to be in the situation that we're in, which is, you know, every time there's a CPI report, the world is either ended or saved. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, you know, if, if people think that, you know, markets have finally weaned themselves of central bankers, I mean, just look at the clown action that we've seen during the last two j Powell speeches you know it markets immediately ripped on him just going to the microphone you know that, that that's just still part of the equation you know and you get these short-term moves that are just absolutely baffling sometimes it, we, we keep in mind the market is also now you know as central bankers have stepped away, the option gamblers have stepped into the hall. I mean, <laughs> the, the amount of option volume that is now involved in the daily market action, and we're not talking options, long dated option, we're talking daily expiration options. It's it's absolutely maddening what's what's happening on that play. I mean, the, the vast majority of them expire in like 24 hours, right? I mean, it's it's... Yeah. 70 what well, goldman i think it was 72 percent of notional s p is, is is options related you know it seems like the the fed needs to raise rates to 20 percent <laughs> to get the excess out i mean it's it's right. it's it's got to recognize the fingerprints that are in there in there as well right so uh my best my best view right now is what i said earlier we're in now we had we had technical breakouts and optimism come back strength has to be respected but the notion that a new bull market is confirmed is too mature in my view unless we have confirmed move and sustained move above the monthly 20 ma then if that's the case i think these larger bullish patterns can play out in the first half of the year let's say april may you know, late May, late April, early May, maybe. Um, 
who bears to be successful in invalidating the technical breakouts that we have seen, we need to see a sustained drop below the daily 200 MA and back below the breakout trend line. So let's say roughly pin it around 3,900 to 3,950. Unless that happens, then this next dip, whatever it is, is going to get bought, whether you like it or not. No, yeah. And maybe the seasonality chart just keeps driving everything. Um, and in the meantime, so, you know, we'll, we'll probably hear, and by the way, keep in mind, just generally in mind, April is typically a very bullish month in, in the market, right? So it was even last year, right? Yeah. during the bear market so just be aware of, of seasonality that as well um so we'll have to see if we get a larger dip here for a back test if the back test holds rally opportunity probably into april if the back test does not hold then things are going to look really ugly i am open to 32 32 sometime this year uh from a technical perspective but I just don't know whether we're going to get first that big rally and then the rollover. Or worst case, it was the most controlled bear market ever. The Fed achieves, achieves immaculate disinflation and it's cherry, roses, and, and, and one-eyed <laughs> unicorns from here on. You know, nothing. I mean, look, look at, I, I go back to FTSE, new all-time highs. The DAX is back to where it was at the beginning of last year. Nothing happened. Absolutely nothing happened. It's like, you know, higher rates don't matter. Slowing economy does matter. Right, higher energy costs. Yeah, it's all good. Then, yeah. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> so so th thanks, uh, Sven. So if I can sort of summarize, um, and you're saying, look, in the short term, we, we've got a chance for it to, to rip higher for a while. If it does, it sounds like you don't really trust it. Meaning um, this is something that you still, again, we're talking probabilities, think is more likely to get back down to that 3,200-ish level at some point this year. It's just sort of a matter of when because of all the uh, macro stuff that we talked about. Adam, I'll give you the, the straight and honest answer. I don't know. And, and the reason I don't know is because I don't have the data in how things will evolve. I am open-minded to it. Um, but I will not be so arrogant to say is exactly how everything is playing out. We we got to recognize that we're in probably the most complicated macro environment ever uh, because of what happened with COVID, what happened with the money printing. Don't forget, you know, central bankers play a big part in this still. Uh, I would say based on history, uh, based on the debt construct, based on the early science that we're seeing in terms of the economy slowing down, leading indicators, layoffs happening. Uh, it's, it seems that these this path to a soft landing is extremely narrow. But keep in mind, I go back to what I said very early on, yield curve inversions, they have room to see market rallies higher. Even the Fed saying there's going to be a soft landing may still even lead to new market highs first. That's what they happened in 2007. Mm -hmm. right? From February to September, we had new market highs. Okay. And one thing, you know, go back to positioning as well. If you look at the AAII survey, that has improved a bit, but it was bearish all last year into the beginning right. of this year. Super bearish, and, yeah. And positioning was horrific. That's why you get the short covering rally. And look at money market funds, cash levels at all time highs. Highest levels ever. Ever is a very long time. And you, you cannot be completely close minded to the fact that, oh my God, if you get a real FOMO rally, that maybe people are starting to chase. And it, it may just be absolutely mind blowing. To, I'm not calling for any of this. I'm, I'm just saying. You're just saying, yeah, if it happens, you don't want to stand in front of that wall of cash coming in. Yeah, especially now, if it actually inflation continues to come down in a significant way, doesn't get really disturbed, you and you got the China reopening, all of a sudden you got just, you know, roses flying everywhere. And, 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 <laughs> and then things can get very, very strange. 
You'd so crazy I, what I'm saying about 32.32 is I, I have a technical confluence at the beginning of October where two major trend lines and levels come together. Um, it would make perfect sense for a buy if that were to happen because I can envision all kinds of signal charts to be massively oversold again. Uh, it, so I'm, I'm keeping that out as an open mind. I have bullish patterns that point a lot higher that also makes sense and i'm actually not opposed and i say this again i'm not opposed to both things happen right okay. first one then the other which yeah. to me actually would be wonderful because uh, what a trade right right <laughs> what a what a trade point is I'm, I'm saying you know the october lows on the monthly 50 ma along with the bottom trend lines with the VIX making lower highs, with new highs, new lows on 2008 levels, with you know key resistance hit on the dollar, all these pieces coming together made the argument for a massive rally to come uh, to 4,200. By the way, I did say that at the end of October on CNBC Fast Money, I see 4,200. We got there. Now we're in the negotiation phase where we're going to have to kind of noodle through it. And once the evidence tells us where the support holds, on any pullback then yes we have a shot at these upside targets if it doesn't then obviously we don't so th this is where i'm where i don't want to make predictions rather i want to see what actually happens That's right and where the technicals tell me is the pivot of control for for the market okay that that, that all that all sounds great and i i, I... You know, like I said, when we, when we know which way we're going, we'll bring you back on for an update on the technical. I want to close more on sort of the macro, but really more on the social, which is last time you were on, you and I had a, a great discussion that the audience really, I think, um, it resonated with them. Uh, and it was it was about a quote that you had made at the time where you'd said, first, we made the rich insanely rich. Then we let inflation run wild. And now it's pain for the most vulnerable. And I think since the last time you were on, which I can't remember exactly when it was, but it was probably like five, six months ago, at least. Um, I think that comment has only continued to prove true in spades, where <clears throat> the pain of the masses has increased. And even with this recent surge in the markets, it's really only benefiting the 10% that own 90% of financial assets, right? Whereas assets that, that the majority own, like houses, are now actually an official rollover uh, phase now and, and hard to, not to see that momentum continuing to the downside this year with mortgage rates as high as we are, plus a whole other bunch of factors. Yet into that, the accelerating layoffs we're seeing, and if we do end up getting a harder landing than is being sold to us right now, it's the worker that's going to pay for that. By the way, the worker that despite uh, increased uh, nominal wages over the past you know year it has had 21 straight months of real wage decreases right? so um you know I I just I just want to give you a chance to continue to opine on this because I know it's near and dear to both of your hearts here which is with all the intervention you know whether the Fed is maybe making another policy mistake by tightening too much into this you know uh economic slowdown um it is the regular person that's going to be bearing the, the brunt of, of these mistakes. It's not going to be the favored classes that have been benefiting so much or the I, people I, making the decisions. You know, you and I, and, and anyone's watching this, we, we, we can all have our viewpoints on it. Uh, we, I think we see the reality in, in people's lives. Um, but there is no political real acknowledgement of that. I mean, everybody's patting themselves on the back. Look, 3.4% on unemployment is the greatest economy ever. But that happened on the previous administration as well. While we know there's not only all kinds of problems with the data that is right. being presented to the public, i.e. seasonal adjustments, but the reality is a lot of people have are forced to work multiple jobs, menial jobs to make ends meet. My my general concern has been for a while about social fragmentation. Mm -hmm. And it's expressed in political 
um, veering off to extremes mm -hmm. on on both sides. I, I think in general, people, you know, if they're, I, I'd say maybe discontent, dissatisfied, uh, and and have no real way out tend to gravitate towards extremes because they, they're, seek, they're seeking for they're seeking answers yeah and desperate people act desperately it's just understandable and 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 and, and you know the loudest voices often get the most attentional support in, in that sense you know even even if it doesn't produce a solution you know if they yell at the other side that's satisfying in itself right and it's let's face it the political divisions globally are widening they've not improved over the years the middle class has been shrinking for 40 years you know the, the, the all this money printing has not widened or improved the middle class it has not no it is dramatically enriched the already rich as, as your initial statement had said and it's killing the middle class as they're getting you know squeezed by higher cost of living uh, and so, lack of opportunity so uh, uh, you know we know who benefited during the run-up of the bubble we we know who got hurt with inflation and now we have easing financial conditions again and being denied from the very top uh and asset prices rising again, but who's getting the layoff notices? Exactly. Okay. So, Sven, you you live in the world of probabilities. That's what you do for a living. Like, like, what do you see from here? How, how, how does how does this increasing tension manifest and potentially get resolved? Um, is it is it through social revolt? Is it through something else? Or is it through well, some some massive market correction? The financial system just corrects on its own, and and you know, I, I, I I don't know. I, personally, I I don't see a lot of great probabilities for painless ways out of this where everybody's happy. Well, I mean, it's 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 frankly baffling at this point. I mean, look look at the debt ceiling debate right now, right? Uh, this you mean the Kabuki of, theater? <laughs> it's 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 fascinating. I mean, that they they cannot keep the system afloat without just expanding debt which by the way all debt that is now being taken on has to be taken on at much higher rates which will only exactly. exacerbate the that, 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 that's why i'm saying this whole notion of higher for longer is a complete fantasy right you know? and sorry to interrupt but a massive chunk of the existing debt pile has to refinance as well in the next like year or two right i mean it's every, all every year every year and it was all based on nothing and you know this is this is this is like the, the ultimate doom effect and so it's ironic while you have the, the political spectrum being so divided uh and and basically marketing the, the divide and so they almost think that there is method behind the madness because mm -hmm. you as long as you have that you you if you don't have a common reality you can't agree on common solution but Oddly enough, the only thing they ever agree upon is to spend more money. That they can agree upon, right? Um, no, I, 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 I don't have a solution. That's that's what bugs me the most because, you know, if you could reason with unreasonable people, there wouldn't be unreasonable people. <laughs> it, it's unfortunately that the world doesn't work that way, right? Uh, and and unfortunately, the folks that have benefited from a shrinking class are continuing to benefit from a shrinking middle class. But yeah, how how can you have social cohesion in an environment where none of these things ever improve and get ever more skewed? And I, you know, they've been able to keep any recession very short. I give them credit for that. That. That continuous intervention scheme that we've seen over the last 14 years has worked to keep pain minimized. I just don't mm -hmm. know that if the, if the controlled demolition at some point becomes uncontrolled, that's, I think, when we're going to have the real test. Uh, and, and I don't wish for that, but maybe the only way to, to get out of everybody's respective 
reality bubbles is to face it. I mean, look, look, look what's this disaster just now in Turkey and Syria. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, horrific. Yeah. And, and, you know, it it hits the poor people of the world in, in a horrific infrastructure. And, you know, but you see people working together, right? Everybody's coming together to to, to hell, you know, that, unfortunately, this, this is sometimes what it takes you know, United I don't want to see that crisis. happen. Yeah, yeah. That this is maybe when everybody's reminded what's actually really important, not not some fantasy narrative, on on some level. I don't, I don't, I don't want a disaster. I have a VIX chart that says, you know, VIX going over hundred. I don't want that to happen because that means something really terrible is happening. Yeah. You know, I mean, I see it as a possibility, but I don't want to. You know, certain things you don't want to see come come true right, look at the ai look at AI, ai chatbot you know we're all new in this we can laugh at as i had some conversations with it and some were really daft which tells me this is not prime time yet but at the same time you can certainly see uh the exponential improvements that can yeah. come from this and before you know it you know as as hard as it is already to get a hold of a live person and customer service with any company, you will never speak to a human again. Right. Uh, you can envision all kinds of jobs just disappearing with this stuff. I, I do. <laughs> I actually do. It, and across the board. You know, right. w- blue collar, white collar, just up, the, up and down the stack. Yep. Have you seen Boston Dynamics? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, really? and hey, you 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 map you know the a- AI intelligence of Chat GBT and its successors with the Boston Dynamic robots, and pretty soon we're living in the Terminator world, right? We're we're we're, we're uh, not needed anymore as uh, as wetware one models. Well, on the bright side, I can then chop more wood, I guess. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, look, you've given us so much time. Uh, Sven, it's been phenomenal. I I will let you go chop your wood. Before I do, though, let me ask my final question, which is for people that have really enjoyed listening to you in this discussion, especially those that might not have been familiar with your work beforehand, where can they go to follow you in your work? Well, the the easiest is on Twitter is at Northman Trader. Uh, The website is northmantrader.com. Uh, this is where we have our subscription services. I, I also post the Northcast on Twitter, but I also post them in the YouTube channel. Uh, this is where we talk about high level technicals. We obviously go into a lot more depth in the subscription services. Uh, there's a market video that I put out two or three times a month that is going into great detail on the big picture and what we're seeing. Uh, but then also the daily market brief where we track our strategy on a regular basis. So that's that's where I'm at most of the time. All right. Well, Sven, you are one of the guys that I follow literally every day. Highly recommend that everybody go and check out both your Twitter and your website. When we edit this, Sven, I'll put up the links uh, to those handles so folks know exactly where to go. Um, but Sven, it is always just a total joy getting to talk with you. Thanks so much for coming on the program. Thanks for giving us so much of your time. And I don't envy the wood. You're going to go out there and destroy it looking like that. Absolutely. Adam, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I love wood chopping. It's great. I mean, it's you know, just one of my joys. I, I see you doing a lot of exercises. I saw a couple of clips of you doing the pull-ups and all that. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I'd see you out there not only chopping your wood, but, you know, uh, riding horses in the surf uh, in Africa. I mean, it's amazing what you what you get up to. What would be fun, Sven, is at some point I'm going to head to the UK when I do. I'll come by. Maybe we'll do a little video of us uh, both chopping some wood together, but maybe doing a little axe throwing, too. Well, you got to teach me the axe throwing. I only throw it at wood. Um one one thing I do is these days is I, I've picked up running again. So I live out in the countryside here. So we I, I run a lot of uh, country roads and I come across trees that have fallen. And then I come back with the truck and the chainsaw. And the, that's that's how I get my supplies. So it's a, it's a process. 
but it keeps you fit. That's for it sure. Keeps, yeah, you, you, you are a manly man, Sven. I will say that. There's a lot of guys, myself included, watching right now who are feeling a little diminished, um, but it's oh, awesome. Oh, shut up. I've seen those pull-ups. <laughs> I'm, I'm inspired. <laughs> All right, buddy. Well, look, thanks so much. Look forward to having you back on, especially once the markets clarify whether they're going up or, or down uh, per your, your probabilities there. Love to have you back on to tell you what you think will happen after that. Final note for me, for everybody, keep an open mind. This is a very complex journey this year, and anything can happen. So this is this is an intellectual puzzle, and I, I love solving it. That's that's the mission. Great. Well, well said, brother. Thanks so much, Ben. All right. Well, now is the time in the program where we bring in the lead partners from New Harbor Financial, one of the financial advisory firms endorsed by Wealthion. I'm joined today by lead partner, Mike Preston. John Lodra is off for the week. Mike, great to have you on here. Love to hear your thoughts on uh, the, the long conversation that we just recorded here with Sven. Um, a lot of material to cover, but what were some of the top key takeaways you took from it? Yeah, I love that talk. And it was a bit of a marathon. I think it uh, you know went well over an hour and a half, but uh, we've been long followers of Sven Henrik. Um, he's pretty prolific on Twitter. And, um, you know, he's he shares a lot of really great technical patterns and technical insights. And I took a lot from this conversation that was very useful. And, and I'll, I'll summarize a few of the things I've got here in my notes. Uh, you know, he says that financial conditions have started to ease starting in October. I mean, he's absolutely right about that. And technical patterns have started to improve. You know, it's hard to to stay unbiased in this in this business sometimes. And. I can say that the the fundamentals of the the macro uh, data is very bad. It's it, it remains very bad, and Sven points that out. I think he said something like the macro the macro picture is just about as bad as he's ever seen. It's true. Valuations are are terrible. You know, there's any number. There's a lot of different ways that you can measure valuations: stock market cap, the GDP, uh, Schiller, uh, you know, adjusted price index ratio. Uh, sales, uh, you know, divided by price, a whole bunch of different things. All of them are still at levels at or exceeding previous bubble highs, particularly the 99 uh, slash 2000 high and, and certainly the 2008 high. So we're well beyond that. And these valuations have a very good track record of predicting future returns. They've got a very bad track record of predicting the timing of a bear market or return. But given present valuations, we can expect negative annual returns on average on the S&P over the next 10 years. Put a different way, we should expect the S&P to be no higher, or maybe even lower than where it is today, 10 years from now. So that presents very, very difficult uh, conundrum for money managers or investors. You're, you're really kind of feeling like you have to be in the market. Um, and, and really, the Fed, I would say, is trying to create this feeling, this psychological discomfort, this fear of missing out, because that's the name of the game here is to force prices higher. That's the only way the debt can be serviced. But this game has been going on a long time. If we're really honest about it, this game has been going on a good 30 years and it's probably ending. Sven says that uh, central planners have they've worked hard to to keep recession short and to keep pain minimized and it's in each each recession is shorter than the last the recession that we had in march of 2020 was something like a month which is just unheard of so how many times can we keep doing this how many rabbits can we pull out of a hat you know how long can we kick the can i think at some point they fail it's a key part of our thesis that we think the central planners fail but of course that has you uh, somewhat backed into a corner and, and sounding like a doomsday scenario person. But honestly, I think that's where central planners have put us. They have no plan B. They pull one lever and one lever o only over and over again. And it's a dangerous place. Uh, I'll pause for a minute, but there's so, so many more things that I want to point out that he talked about. Yeah. So <clears throat> I'm going to put up a chart here. I really haven't had a chance to really dig into too much, Mike, and I know you're seeing it here for the first time, um, <clears throat> but it's a chart of global net liquidity, um, which basically is is showing all the liquidity that the central banks are pumping into the system here. And you'll see that uh, going into uh, 2022, 
Uh, it started decreasing. Um, the data here is only for, yeah, I don't know, about um, six months before 2021. Um, so it's only for the past couple of years, but it was it was rising. And then it started coming down. And, and basically the correlation with the, the major market indices is like almost near perfect here, right? And it, it bottomed and started going back up in about October of this past year, which is exactly what you were just saying, uh, you know, Sven was commenting on, right, is that we sort of hit the most recent market lows in October, and then things have been moving up since then. And that that probably largely a function of the massive amount of liquidity that China has been pumping in as it's been reopening here. Um, in the latest slice of this chart looks like, uh, you know, things are declining a little bit here again. So maybe that spigot is is now getting turned off, or who knows? Maybe this is just a pause. But to your your main point there, Mike, which is the central banks really only have one trick, and how long will that trick continue to work? Uh, one might look at this chart and say, "Hey, the the bounce that we've seen in the markets um, over the past couple of months has maybe been almost entirely due." Uh, to liquidity, especially because, as Sven and I talked about, and a number of other recent folks in this channel and I have talked about, like it's really hard to make a bullish case here based on the macro data, right? All the macro data is pretty horrible right now. The only really bullish case that you can make right now is the technical one is that that stocks are going up. And maybe this is the reason why. So curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, stocks are going up. The technicals have improved. You know, we're making higher highs, higher lows. Looks like resistance is in the 4,200, 4,300 area, maybe on the S&P. As you pointed out, liquidity uh, started starting to come back into the market. You have to ask yourself, how long can that same trick go on? We know from history that nothing is for free. There's no free lunch. Um, but what makes it difficult is that in the day to day, emotionally, um, you feel like you want to be part of it. And money managers are pressured to be part of it, too. And so uh, it's it's a difficult spot. Sven says he doesn't want to miss out on 20% rallies, even in a what I would say is a hideous macro environment. We don't either. But it's tough because when the turns come and the accidents tend to be to the downside in very overvalued times in history and in, in, in very um, mechanically contrived times in history, let's say, this is certainly um, a controlled market. And the market, somewhat frustratingly for us, had a controlled decline last year, You know, go, going into, I guess it was the October low. Very controlled, you know, not even, you know, overall 20% on the S&P. It was a little worse, I think, at one point, but it right. closed at less in, than in 20%. In a slow degrade, it didn't happen in a cascade, right? Yeah. It didn't. You know, I know we got somewhat oversold in October. And looking back, you could say, well, everyone was too negative. We were oversold. Of course, we we're going to bounce. Well, that's not really that obvious. You know, maybe in hindsight, it's obvious because the biggest crashes in market history have come from oversold times, oversold conditions, over negative conditions. And when you don't get that bounce, then the waterfall happens, the elevated drop happens. And each one of those times that we bounced was a very perfect setup for that type of thing to happen. And you have to have plans in place ahead of time to protect for that. So it's not as easy as it looks in hindsight. And so Quantitative easing has driven these markets crazy, like Sven said. They, they've driven people crazy. It almost defies logic. Um, and, and, you know, it's we're, we're probably not going to get away with it. We're going to have an accident. The Fed is going to lose control. It's going to look obvious in hindsight. Everything that we do on a day-to-day -day basis keeps that in mind. We try not to miss vertical rallies. Maybe we'll even have a vertical rally. Maybe we'll even have that vertical rally to six or 7,000 on the S&P. Um, that one of your guests, David Hunter, has talked about. But it's almost impossible to catch that without taking risk right now, today. Because you know we're in this range here between maybe 3,800 and 4,300 on the S&P. If the S&P rolls over, and it could be doing so today, we'll see where you know, the market's down today after the CPI print this morning. We could very quickly go to 3,800. We can go there in one day, and then the waterfall starts. So you have to have a mixture of good cash reserves, hopefully some hedging strategies, maybe some tight stops in place if you're going to play this market. Have a plan to get out and don't be afraid to get out if your thesis turns out to be wrong. Yeah, well, and, and so on those ranges you just mentioned, so you know, Sven was really clear in, in this interview 
from his technicals, he says there's a battle for control right now, right? Where um, the 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 bullish rally is, you know, he he said, hey, it looks like it needs to retest 4,000. And uh, if it does and bounces strongly off of that, he says that's a, a technical green light to pretty much run up to 4,300, 4,400 on the S&P. So that's like a, that's like a 10% gain in what will be a very quick period of time. Um, on the bear side, he said, you know, if the bears manage to get down below 3950, he said, then the probability of the markets going lower and probably much lower gets dramatically higher. And I believe the number that he said was 3232 is where mm -hmm. he sort of thinks the next major support would be. So that would be, you know, like a 20% market decline in a relatively quick period of time. So, you know, he called it this battle for control. We're watching it play out in real time right now. So we'll be watching this tape very closely. Um, and one of the things to, to what you're saying there, Mike, is, you know, people will say, well, you know, if the, if the central banks have that, you know, that bazooka, right, that always works for them, they just bring out more liquidity. And, and to that chart I showed, you know, then that just sends the market higher. Well, why can't they just keep doing that forever, right? And, and the, the big limiter this time around what is different this time around is inflation. And I just recorded the interview yesterday with Grant Williams, where he was really zeroing in on this, which is for the past you know, 15 plus years that the Fed and the other central banks have been able to, to use that liquidity bazooka with impunity because inflation wasn't an issue. Well, now it's become one, right? So now Powell's biggest fear is he takes out the bazooka um, shoots it, and then he's the next Arthur Burns, right? Where you know inflation rages back up, and when we have you know a horrible decade like we did in the '70s that requires some massive inter, you know massive austerity like like Volcker's crazy rate hikes. So, you know, I think Powell, as he's very clearly stated, is trying to get out in front of that right now, and uh, very well may you know have the backbone that he says he's going to have in terms of continuing the hike from here. Uh, and then pausing for a lot longer than the market is currently pricing in. The market's currently pricing in that he's going to start cutting rates in this midsummer, in July, I think is the the latest predictions. Um, and Powell is certainly saying, no, I'm 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 going to hold it through probably through the year, right? Um, today's inflation print probably makes that a little bit more likely. And and we've seen the um, the odds on future rate hikes spike uh, today in response to this. Because, uh, yes, the 6.4% print was lower than the December CPI, but it was higher than what folks were thinking it was going to be. Uh, so it was a bit of a surprise to the upside, suggesting that inflation might be a little bit more sticky uh, than the market has been hoping. Um, and, and we've been talking about this, Mike, right, that the, the market just has not been believing Jerome Powell. They've been playing a game of chicken where he's been saying, I'm going to be you know, a lot tougher than you think I am. And the market's been saying, ah, we don't believe you. Well, one of those two parties is right. And if the market realizes that Powell is, is more likely to be right, it's going to have to go through a repricing. So that's obviously maybe a little bit of what we're seeing today. But if, if today's action goes down below the 3950 level, that could very well be the repricing that the market needs to do and you know falling down to spends 32 32 uh targets so I'm not saying that's how it's exactly going to play out but i think we now kind of have some parameters that spend has laid out for us to watch out for and we now have some recent macro data that may may serve as the trigger to determine whether we're going to bounce off the 4000 level or whether we're going to puncture down through the 3950 and head lower absolutely that 3200 level on the s p i absolutely agree with um i've been saying for over six months that it looks like we're going to get an elevated drop to 3200 i've been amazed at how many times we've bounced vertically off technical support levels um so i've been wrong on the timing but absolutely we break down from here particularly below 39 or 3800 we should go straight to 3200 but we keep delaying the inevitable and by the way a drop to 3200 is about 20 percent down from here I don't even think that would be the end of the bear market. The history says that there's three distinct phases, you know, in a, in a bear market, a, a, a quick drop that brings you down maybe a third, that would be down to about 3,200, then a bounce for a while, then a, then a loss of another third where the realization sets in that, hey, this is a real bear market. This is not going to be over soon. 
that second third would bring us down to maybe somewhere in the low 2000s. And then if this was a true historic bear market like we think it will be, there would eventually be a third, third capitulation phase that would bring us down to maybe 1600, 1800 on the S&P, something like that for a total loss of two thirds off the top. That's how you that's how you get down there. You lose a third bounce, second third, then a third third, get you down 66%. That's what I think is likely to happen before this bear market is over. So that first phase wouldn't even be finished until about 3,200. And we're really surprised at how long this, this thing has gone on and how much we bounce. But you know, here we are. Today, the CPI print comes in at 6.4% versus the 6.2% expectations. And you point out that it was better than December, but December was also revised up. I don't have this specific number in front of me, but September was actually revised higher, maybe making those comparisons not look as rosy. So we've had some moderation from the extreme high print of 9% or so last year, but inflation is persistent. And I don't blame this market for not believing that Powell is going to be tough because the Fed has been easy for 30 years, particularly the last 10 years. So why wouldn't the market not expect you know, the Fed to do whatever it takes? Mario Draghi, when he was uh, you know, uh, chair, said, we're going to do whatever it takes. Everyone's been doing whatever it takes. But now we're having inflation problems. And it's not just in this country. Travel to some other countries. And I, and I have done so. I've, I've seen other, other countries. And I've seen how much it's affecting the average person in other places, not just here, but in, in third world countries, for instance, where the income is much lower on average, and now they're dealing with higher prices and can't cope with it. All of these are negative social ramifications of this money printing scheme that we've come up with, this new idea, this magic idea. And so, but even just focus, focusing in on this country, we have created more billionaires in the last 10 years than ever before in history. And the wealth disparity has gotten to an extreme where I think most people can see it. The bottom 40 or 50% of this country have not had the wealth increase that the top few percent have had. And uh, it creates a situation where we may have more social strife and more social conflict. Sven talked about that a good bit in this talk, and he's concerned about that. And we all should be concerned because it creates a, a system um, that's less fair and more prone to um, negative consequences. And, and frankly, it's, it's, it all comes back to central planning. You know, I hate to harp on it, but I'm not a big fan of central planning. And I think it's caused a less free market and, uh, and less freedom for all of us. So we'll see what happens next. But uh, I believe there's going to be a time where, where this doesn't work anymore. And I think that time is likely coming soon. Yeah. Well, it, 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 you know, may not work for a couple of reasons, right? One, it may not work uh, because they can't do whatever it takes because the inflation problem, right? Um, that's the big limiter. Uh, but to your also to your other point, which I brought up as Sven, was we might get to a social limit as opposed to a you know fiscal limit, right? Where people just start start saying no more. We just we just can't. You know, we we either can't feed our families, right? Which tends to happen and. In the weaker countries first, and we've seen that in many other countries. That's sort of what caused the Arab Spring a decade ago. But I mean, we saw just in you know Sri Lanka recently, right, where they they raided the presidential palace because literally they just had no other options, right? And I can't feed my family. I've got nothing else to do except turn on the people in power and say you're not taking care of us, right? Um, and you know, when I was asking Sven about that at the end of this interview, you know, sadly, you know, he just sort of said, I I, I just don't see a way that that we end we get out of this gracefully. Right. His fear is, is that we have some so, sort of social breaking point. But that is a whole other, you know, video in and of itself. Mike, we're not going to be able to parse through the the very worthy intricacies of that here in just the last couple of minutes. Um, one thing I do want to note, though, which is, um, you know, the central banks understand the inflation constraint there. Right. That, hey, we, we to be able to continue doing things the way we like to do, we got to get inflation under control first. And um, I was asked by the media for what my thoughts were on, on this morning's print. And, you know, I basically said, look, um, uh, you know, uh, the 6.4% print was higher than folks thought. And so it, it might show that in the short term, inflation might be a little more stubborn. 
to get under control, but but it still is coming down, right? It is continuing the trajectory of disinflation. And it's showing that Powell's uh, platform or his, his regime of demand destruction is working, right? The gravity of that demand destruction, demand destruction tractor beam is, is intensifying, right? And as Powell has been telling us, he said, look, you know, there's a lag effect to what I'm doing. I've done 450 basis per points worth of rate hikes that haven't fully hit the economy yet. Like that's all coming, folks, right? And so um, I think it's it's more likely than not that the demand destruction is going to accelerate from here. Um, and uh, we're going to start seeing inflation, you know, as measured by CPI, start coming down pretty, pretty swiftly from here, especially because what's really propping up that 6.4% number that we saw today uh, was shelter, right? And the housing data that goes into the Fed CPI calculation is very lagging. It's much more reflective of what was happening in housing 12 months ago versus what's happening now. And as we know, because we've been tracking the real-time data on this channel you know, a lot, is that Housing market has rolled over nationally, and some markets are, are really beginning to feel a lot of pain. Others are, are taking longer to, to follow suit, but they are following suit. Um, and, uh, and and so we know the trajectory of, of the housing data going forward, which is it's going to be going downwards, right? So that's going to start actually pulling CPI down as opposed to, to keeping it up, right? So sort of where I was going with all this is... Um, we may see this acceleration of disinflation. And the problem is, is the Fed is looking at that housing data and its impact on the current CPI and saying, well, that's our rationale that we need to still keep tightening to get inflation down towards more of our 2% target. So they're going to continue to do rate hikes from here. You combine that with a lag effect uh, finally manifesting in the economy. You know, we might really see uh, a huge acceleration in the decline in economic growth from here, right? So, what might be happening here is the Fed continues to hike rates into all this. Is that it? Very well, may be being guilty of what many experts on this channel have have said they fear, which is that it is over tightening, right? That that the Fed would be better to just pause now. Maybe even best to having paused a couple of rate hikes ago, and then just hang out and see. Okay, did we already tighten enough? Uh, and you know, is our job done? Or hmm, maybe we didn't. Let's start tightening again to finish the job. The danger of of continuing to tighten now is you you basically are tightening into an economic deceleration, and you create a recession that is much deeper, and more prolonged, and more painful than would otherwise be necessary here. Right. And and if if that were to happen. What probably would likely happen after that is the Fed and the central banks would say, oh, 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 we tighten too much. And then they go back to, you know, cutting rates and stimulating again, and they potentially just start the cycle all over again. Right. So kind of what I told people was, is, hey, uh, just because inflation was a little bit higher than, you know, folks thought it was going to be today, and it's still at an elevated level of 6.4 we may not be that far from a day where inflation no longer becomes the big concern. And if the Fed over tightens, we may, hard as it is to believe, but we may find ourselves more concerned about deflation in the later half of this year. Not guaranteeing that's going to happen, but I can certainly see the possibility and the growing probability of that given the current conditions that I just mentioned here. I see you nodding as I'm saying all this, Mike. Yeah, I can absolutely see that deflation could be a real risk here. Um, you know, look, I think the real problem is that the is that the central banks have gotten so involved in the day-to-day -day management of the markets, and they've just way, way overstepped what their mission really should have been. You know, it's like a car skidding in one direction, and then you overcorrect to the other side, and eventually you might lose control and, the, and, and you have a bad accident, you know. And so um, I think, and maybe it's a hope, I, I, I hope that that error ends someday, and unfortunately it probably comes about due to an accident, but history tells us that that's likely to happen, that pressures are building and and that something unexpected is likely to happen. That is something that we're prepared for here. That is something that will bring opportunities to many and maybe some you know uh, more freedom in markets and more freedom for, um, for, for price discovery and expression. So I don't want to say that I'm hoping for that, but in a way I'm hoping for, for more free uh, free markets eventually. And so we know that the macro environment is bad. We know that uh, markets are not likely to, to, to yield positive returns from here over the next decade. What we don't know is if there's one more blow off top in the next couple of months, or if we have a, 
a drop right from here, or even that we go sideways for 15 years and eventually, you know, correct that way. That's possible too. Um, but our advice is the same to strongly or, or radically reduce equities. We would suggest less than 30%. Have some gold and silver, maybe to the extent of five, five or 10% of investable assets, because we could have an accident here. Maybe we have an accident, we have runaway hyperinflation. So don't wait to get those protections in place. Don't wait to reduce stock market exposure. You're getting paid 4.5% to weight in treasury bills right now, which is which is you know the first time in, in well over a decade that you can get paid fairly on savings. We have a continued inverted yield curve, which is a sign of economic sickness. Uh, you get paid 4.5%, almost 4.7% on short-term treasury bills and something like 3.5, 3.6 on 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 ten years, so you've got a you've got a, a yield curve that's inverted more than one percent for short term treasuries versus longer term treasuries. That will uninvert at some point, probably coincident with an accident that we that we fear can happen. So um, just be prepared. Uh, there's a lot. There's going to be lots of uh, uh, opportunities to react to. We'll be here uh, doing our best, telling you what we're doing uh, on a weekly basis. And um, be prepared for just about anything. All right, great. Well, look, Mike, well said. We'll have to leave it there. Uh, good news is we're going to have you back on again this week uh, in the wrap up to the Grant Williams uh, interview. Um, all right. And as we wrap things up here, folks, just a couple quick resources for you. One, just a reminder that our March uh, conference, our spring conference for Wealthion, our online conference uh, is coming up on March 18th. That's a Saturday. And a reminder that if you can't watch the live event, Everybody who registers uh, will be sent replay videos of the entire event afterwards, both the presentations as well as the, the live Q&A with the audience. Uh, to learn more about that event, just go to Wealthion.com slash conference, and you can still lock in the early bird discount pricing too if you go soon. Um, secondly, um, Sven did a great job in this interview of really underscoring what an unbelievably challenging market this is uh, to uh, to navigate. You know, In his words, he said, uh, this he's never seen a year with so many possibilities of where prices could go. Um, you know, he's all about mapping out the most likely probabilities and, and you know using TA to calculate where things are going. He's saying he's never had so many options before, which makes it really challenging, even for the pros like him. So if you're a regular person, uh, we as always on this channel, we highly recommend that you partner with a financial advisor who's experienced, takes into account all the macro issues we talked about here, takes into account the technical issues here too in navigating the markets in the short term, uh, and one that can help you create a you know, personalized custom plan for your portfolio, uh, but then also execute it for you, um, you know, both in the long term, but also navigating all these, these short term uncertainties that we have as well. If you have a good one that already does that for you, great, stick with them. If not, or if you'd like a second opinion from one who does, consider scheduling a free consultation with one of the advisors that Wealthy and endorses, maybe even Mike uh, and his firm there at New Harbor themselves. Uh, to do that, just go fill out the short form at Wealthion.com. Again, doesn't cost you anything. There's no commitment to work with these guys. Uh, it's just a free service that they offer to help people um, be better prepared for what they see coming. All right, Mike, uh, thanks again for joining me today uh, for the recap here with Sven. I'll see you in uh, just 48 hours for the recap with Grant. Um, I'll let you have the last word. Any parting words for our audience here, Mike? No, just like I said, be prepared, be careful. Anything can happen. We're in a crazy um, psychologically driven environment that's very contrived. So be cautious, be prepared. Don't be scared, though. Um, there's going to be lots of uh, opportunities to react and uh, and to maybe even take advantage of, of what's coming. And just uh, thank you, Adam, for the opportunity to be here every week. We really enjoy it. And we'll see you soon. All right. Always a pleasure. Uh, Mike, thanks again for joining me. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching.